Yes. Thank you so very much this afternoon uh, for joining us on this show. It's going to be exciting, of course, because of my um, guest in the studio. You, you will like him. I, I know, of course, it's a delight anytime. Now, um, this afternoon, we sincerely want to apologize, first of all, for um, starting behind schedule. We gave you 12 o'clock, of course, um, technical issues, and um, we've got to start now. Um, we appreciate again for your consistency uh, in, on the John Mayaki show. This afternoon, we'll be discussing with our guest, very special guest. Um, he's honorable, he's a lecturer, yeah, he's a PhD, he's a PhD, uh, he's an academician. Um, honorable Dr. Samson Osage. Good afternoon, um, doctor. Yeah, good afternoon. Do I John. prefer to call you honorable or uh, doctor? Uh, which, which do you prefer? Well, um, of course, <laughs> I'm entitled to be yeah. both uh, epithets. Yeah. Uh, you can even call me something or something. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really matter. What, yeah. is, uh, what is important is that uh, one has been able to put his uh, nose on the grindstone yeah. for a long period now yeah. to have attained some academic heights. Yeah. And that gives me satisfaction. So it doesn't really matter what you choose to call me. Uh, you can call me something. You can call me Osage. You can call me something Osage. <laughs> But uh, you know, in Africa, we like this type. Oh yeah, yeah, we are, we are title, we are yeah. title crazy. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, that's. Uh, I like that humility. That it's yeah. not easy to for you to go through the grindstone and you get your PhD, the research work from masters to PhD. It's not how did you, how did you cope with your legislative activities with your busy schedule? Are you coping school? How did you do it? Well, my my life has uh, always been centered around. Um, push and quest for knowledge yeah, uh, right from uh, the cradle and uh, at uh, infancy i even had to rebel against the family because uh, of my quest for knowledge mm -hmm. and uh, which eventually paid off eventually both for myself and for the family so i cope because i can't do without reading i can't do without studying mm -hmm. and uh, when you do what you like doing mm -hmm. you are able to allocate your time yeah. and cope with the, the challenges that comes from it. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Um, you, you are a lawyer by profession and um, a legislator uh, by excellent. You've been to the State House of Assembly, you've been to National Assembly. Uh, tell us your experience uh, in legislative lawmaking generally. Well, um, I want to say that um, in all of my life's journey, mm. um, having opportunity to serve as a legislator from state to national has been quite of a delight for me and uh, the experiences i can't uh, i can't value in terms of uh, currency and uh, i must confess that it has actually opened up my understanding and vistas about both life generally our nation our continent and governance in its entirety uh, of course, my legal background as a, a lawyer who practiced for a while before venturing into politics uh, was of immense assistance in carrying out my legislative uh, responsibilities. And uh, I had no difficulty at all discharging those responsibilities in my time. And I think that um, those experiences have continued to lead me and uh, I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity to serve. And we we'll continue to do that in and out of office. Now that I'm a practitioner of the law, I'm a teacher of the law, and I think the service continues uh, from the private, uh, from the private uh, uh, background that I'm now currently operating from. For those of you watching us, please feel free, call us and uh, share your thought with us about our special guest here today, uh, Honorable Dr. Samson Osagi. I, I wanted to add chief to it. Maybe we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get somewhere, we'll get a king to give him something like that. I don't think I need that. You? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I need that. <laughs> wow. Uh, Honorable, you are not a lecturer somehow. I, I mean... Yes, yes. Uh, I lecture on part-time basis with the National Institute of Legislative and Democratic Studies. Mm -hmm. Studies. Mm -hmm. I teach... Um, uh, political parties and parliamentary politics. Hmm. That's, what <laughs> That's quite now. interesting. Ex exam is currently going now, ah. now at the school, uh, and I think this is one. This is one area where my experience in the legislature is now being brought to bear uh, to teach uh, 
people who are desirous of expounding their, from the frontiers of their knowledge about the workings of the parliament vis-a-vis mm. uh, -vis the role of political parties. Yes. That is yes. the whole essence. Wow. And with the experience uh, I had for 16 unbroken years of being in the legislature, coupled with my academic background, mm. uh, uh, I culminated my doctorate degree in political economy and development studies. Uh, and I'm a lawyer by profession. Uh, it's one area that I like discuss. It's, it's discussions we mm. continuously to have yeah. about how to improve on legislative governance, yeah. improve on the impulse of the legislature to yeah. good governance. Yes. Because it is the, the organ of government that makes a difference, mm. you know, from a military role. Uh, so that is where I currently uh, lecture at the moment. But Although I also have an appointment hanging from one of the new universities uh, to lecture law. That is here to take off. Oh, great. great. That, that is interesting. But do you, have you noticed that it is one thing to make the law, it's another thing for government to even sign it in as a bill? Uh, do you see uh, the, the crisis, the conflict between the legislature and the executive? Yes, it's unavoidable. Oh, oh it's unavoidable. The reason is clear. The legislature is the assemblage. Mm -hmm of representatives yes, of the people yes. you know from the smallest unit yeah. to the larger constituency and that is why from councillor to state assembly to house of reps you see members representing different segments of the society the intention is to make governance as representative as possible so that people can have their voices heard yes. at every level now when those voices are aggregated mm -hmm into proposals that eventually become bills and they are now sent to one man who the law says must append the signature before it can become law no doubt more often than not there must be areas of disagreement and those disagreements are ironed out by processes which the law have also provided so those disagreements are most, much more likely to happen but you can reduce areas of conflicts if in the course of proposing those, making those proposals into law, there are wide consultations. Mm. There are public hearings. That is the essence of public hearings for people to come and make their inputs, including the executive, so that areas of disagreement and conflict can be reduced as much as possible. And then there is politics, yeah. you know, the contestation for spaces and influence and power. They can also influence the reason why there are always disagreement between legislative proposals and of course exec executive ratifications yeah. recently you got um, inaugurated um, into african bar association um, would you really want to tell us the objective of, the, of that association yes um, first let me make it clear that um, i am first and foremost a member of the nigerian bar association yes because as a lawyer practicing in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I have been called to the bar, Nigerian bar, yeah. as a solicitor and advocate of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. Yes. So because of that, I am a member and I'm subject to the Nigerian Bar Association. Yeah. But there is also the global or continental association called the African Bar Association, which some lawyers across the continent came together to say, look, the legal profession is a veritable tool for ensuring good governance, defense of the rule of law, you know, in any given society. Africa as a continent is a unique continent that offers so much for the world and for itself and its citizens. So to that extent, it was important for them to come together and ensure that they use the law as an instrument for the defense, not only of the profession, but also of the defense of the rule of law yeah. and to guarantee access to justice. So recently, the president and the executive council of the African Bar Association, that is the continental executive yeah. of that association, found me worthy and some of my colleagues to constitute an executive of the Nigerian branch, Nigerian forum, mm. Nigerian chapter yeah. of the African Bar Association to assist them in the actualization and promotion of the objectives of the African uh, Bar Association. Essentially, it was meant to ensure that we take the legal community to the global stage. Yeah. I mean, it was intended to make sure that the legal profession is defended at continental level. Mm. 
It was also intended to ensure that cross-border legal practice can be, you know, can be introduced and can be enhanced yeah. for the benefits of the practitioners and, of course, the enforcement uh, of the rule of law. And it was meant to ensure that at the continental level, there is fraternity mm -hmm. among legal mm -hmm. practitioners. And that has informed the number of activities that the African Bar Association has continued to put together over the years since it was formed. So I'm glad that I have this opportunity to serve the legal profession at this continental level. Yeah. But however, I'm subject to uh, my membership of the Nigerian Bar Association because by, by law and by the rules of the legal profession, um, I have to pay my legal fees, mm -hmm. I have to pay my, my, my practicing fees, yeah. I have to pay my union dues mm -hmm. to the Nigerian Bar Association because that is my uh, primary... The, the Nigerian Bar Association doesn't debar you from doing what you need to do in No, 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 I'm exercising my freedom of association yeah, yeah, yeah. as guaranteed to me by the law of the land and of course by the African Charter yeah. on Human and People's Rights. So there's no conflict at all. Wow. Mm. What, what, do you, what are you set out to do? What do you want to achieve? in this period is it a tenure period it's a two-year tenure oh, okay. uh, assignment okay. it's a two-year tenure assignment yes we are expected to governize the body of lawyers in nigeria you know to buy into the apes and objectives and the mandate of the african bar association encourage them to participate in the association activities last year we had a conference in the army you know uh, which uh, to which uh, the former president of nigeria dr Goodluck jonathan he was the keynote speaker. Uh, because the association is not limited to participation by lawyers alone. Okay. Because lawyers alone doesn't make the society. I mean, in order to have an equitable and egalitarian society governed in accordance with the rule of law, yeah. you need everybody to be on board. And your advocacy must get into the ears of everyone. And in that, profession, in that, in that, in that conference, the, the, the team of which was um, ensuring that conflicts are minimized in the African continent mm -hmm. using the legal profession as a driver. Mm -hmm. A lot of resolutions were reached at Niamey. It, it took place in Niamey, Niger Republic. Yeah. A lot of resolutions were reached and uh, some of which were the fact that there was need there was need for the African leaders to obey court orders. Yeah. Because when you don't obey court orders, whether court at national level, a court at continental level. For example, we have the sub-regional court in Abuja mm. called ECOWAS Court yeah. that have continued to give judgment, which African nations and leaders have continued to ignore. When you don't obey orders that are meant to bring about tranquility, peace, and stability in a country, then you are indirectly calling for anarchy. So part of the crisis that we have continued to find and that has led to instability, political, insta political social, and economic stability, instability in the in the continent is the fact that leaders of African nations have continued to pay deaf ears to the rule of law by obeying court orders because obedience to the rule of by law by not obeying court orders by not obeying court orders obedience to court orders is a sign qua non yes. to the enforcement and enhancement of the doctrine of the uh, rule of law. So they have also, they also come out with a resolution that look the 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 ascendancy of terrorism and terrorist activities that have led to so much insecurity in the African continent is because efforts are not made enough to ensure interagency cooperation among security forces, both within nations and among African nations. I mean, so this is very important. When they act on intelligence timely and then do it collaboratively, we are likely going to see, you know, a downward slide in the. Uh, in the cases of uh, violent uh, crimes that are taking place across Africa. Because the African continent doesn't seem to be safe. It's not only just Nigeria. We have a huge array of trans-border crimes, mm -hmm. you know, that have continued to bedevil the African continent in such a way that it affects both its social and economic life. And an atmosphere of criminality cannot, cannot guarantee success, cannot guarantee growth, cannot guarantee the economic prosperity. So it is the concern of the African Bar Association, and that is why it's recommended, that African nations use going through their security agencies must continue to gather intelligence so that they can nip criminal activities on the board. Otherwise, we are going to continue to live in this kind of situation that may, they, that, that, that may make so many African countries to become vanquished in no time. So this is part of what they are doing. Then 
Projecting into the year, in 2022, the African Bar Association is set to hold another conference in Malawi. And this time it is also intended to institute uh, the legacy of transparent and accountable governance in Africa. And we are going to be looking at the issues and roadmaps, drawing from the resolutions from of the Army, Army Conference. Yeah, so yeah. it is in continuing with guaranteeing good governance, ensuring the enforcement and enthronement of the rule of law, and you know, advocating for peace and security in Africa continent. Particularly now, as we are beginning to see a resurgence yes. in military takeover of yeah, government in yeah. some in our sub-region, yeah. West Africa. This is not to be tolerated. It is a bad omen that signals a very bleak future for yeah, the African yeah, continent. Yeah. We can't tolerate it. And we have often said that the worst form of democracy is, is, is better than any undemocratic government, particularly the military. I mean, so we do not, we cannot continue to fold our hands. As legal practitioners, the legal profession must be in the bastion of advocating continued democratization of the African continent that we guarantee good governance. America has been in a democracy since 1776. Challenges are there, no doubt. But there are always opportunities to correct those challenges through change of government and enforcement of policies and programs that have continued to address different issues that have come. So recourse to military governance is not, it's not a solution to our problem. Regardless of how happy the citizens may be. You know, when the citizens are always very impatient. No matter how bad the civilian government is, there are liberties that you enjoy that the military government cannot guarantee you. So when, is, when military take over, citizens become happy. So many citizens become happy. But the truth of the matter is that those are pyric, pyric moments of relief. They do not guarantee long-lasting solution to the economic and social challenges. So these are issues security, uh, instability in governance, bad governance through implementation of policies that do not guarantee democratic dividends for the African citizens. Obedience, to, the obedience, to, obedience to court orders. Yes. And then the enthronement of a prof, uh, the, the defense of the legal profession for it to continue to serve as a bulwark for putting governor, government in check when they go wrong are the major focus and concerns of the African Bar Association. That, that's quite interesting. If you're watching us, um, please uh, call us and uh, share your thoughts with us on this um, topic today. Like I told you, our guest is uh, Honorable Dr. Samson Osage. Thank you so very much, Honorable. Um, I want Thank to find you. out from you. I'm sure you understand or you know that a lot of um, guys are suffering abroad in jail, foreign jails, uh, in, in the quest for greener pasture, they found themselves in one crisis or the other, and it seems there's nobody advocating for them. Do you see your forum working towards that? Well, the truth of the matter is that um, like those are the offshoots of the uh, challenges that are bedeviling the various nations. Uh, you begin to find immigration problems uh, of this nature when countries, nation states of Africa, uh, are not on the right trajectory towards social and economic development. So you begin to see your citizens leave your country in droves in search of greener pastures. Greener pastures in an environment where they have no control over. Greener pastures in an environment, maybe in better environment where you have laws that are being enforced in accordance with the letters and spirits. So in the course of seeking greener pastures, they forget that you are, they are living in an environment where they have socioeconomic problems, to an environment where it is not as if they are not socioeconomic problems, but where the law operates. So it's a major concern. So for us in the African Bar Association, we continue to advocate for good governance that gives economic opportunities to citizens of the countries mm. that makes up Africa. Because there is less, the, the, the likelihood of people living in droves, especially those who are really, really ignorant and are not in a position to understand, you know, the social, political, and economic legal milieu of their host countries. And they go there, all they want to do is to achieve success, make money, and come back without taking into consideration that there are strict rules and strict laws that they must not run foul for. So it is our concern that some of these issues continue to dominate discussions. Of course, for example, Nigeria, 
set up the NITCOM, Nigeria Diaspora Commission. And the one of this is one of the response to such issues for which we commended government for. We, the law for that uh, diaspora commission was passed in our time when we were in the House of Representatives. And in collaboration with many African countries, they are addressing these issues. But mind you, when a national of any African country goes to a country where death sentence is the penalty for drug peddling, there is little or nothing you can do. So all we would like to continue to do is advocacy that educates and enlightens African citizens who desperately seek for greener pasture in other climes to understand that they must follow the rules and the laws of their host countries. Because there is nothing your country can do when you run foul of the laws of that land. For example, it is death penalty in Malaysia if you are caught with drugs. Mm -hmm. So if, if a Nigerian national or a Ghanaian national goes to Malaysia and pedal drugs, what does the, the, the respective country do? What does the African Bar Association do? Practically nothing. You have to face the music. So forums of this nature is what we use to advocate and let our people know that, look, if you are not debarred from traveling to other countries to go and seek greener pastures, but do so within the rules of engagement within that country. Obey their laws and don't run foul of the laws of their land. What and does Nigeria if, say about, um, what, what is the penalty for drug in Nigeria? In, in Nigeria, drug-related uh, drug offenses, uh, I don't think they carry death penalty, but they carry long-term of imprisonment. Yes, but in some countries that are very strict about it, like most Asian countries, it's death penalty. Let me ask your legal opinion. Between the, the FBI case where um, the President Abakari um, is being invited, and the recent drug issue around Abakari, which come first? Um, which, which do we need to tr get him to U US first, or we try him in Nigeria first? Which one come first? We try a come first. Well, it's double jeopardy for, <laughs> for the Super Cup, yeah. and it's very unfortunate. Okay. He, he, speaks, he speaks so badly of the image of our police force. And of course, our country too. Yes, and, and our yeah, country. Yeah, First, yeah. police force within yeah, us here. Yeah, yeah. And our country as a nation. Yeah. And it drops off on the African continent. Yeah, yeah. And it's very unfortunate. The truth of the matter is that, regardless of which conference, I, I think he, he has, he just have to answer and face the wrath of the law. You know, I mean, defend himself. He has to be given the opportunity to defend himself. But however, I, I, do, not, I do not think that the investigations on the drug issue, which is still currently going on, for which he has been arrested, uh, will not be concluded and possibly tried before his extradition. But a lot, a lot will depend on the enforcement and the Ministry of Justice on what they want to assume. But I also know that the extradition law requires that when someone is facing a criminal charge, mm -hmm. he will have to be tried first year, and maybe the appropriate punishment meted out before. Uh, he goes. But if there be any iota of link, then they may have to decide to consolidate the charge, either to extradite him for trial or try him first and chilling, depending on what evidence is available to them. Are you also, are you also, uh, um, do you also buy the idea that there's a conspiracy theory somewhere where they want to, that it was planned to get him in, involved in all of this so that he would go to the U.S. for trial. Do, is there any... No, no, if there be a conspiracy theory, yeah. it would be to just destroy him with this type of allegation. <laughs> I mean, this, the, if any, anybody who plans this, yes. if it's a conspiracy theory, <laughs> yes. is, it did not, did not help him. Yeah. Because mm. let's even assume that it's not uh, be asked to be extradited. Yes. This particular allegation of being, uh, of aiding and abetting mm. drug peddling yes. for a super call mm. that have been so celebrated mm by no less an institution like the House of Representatives, yes. is very damaging yeah, yes. to his person yes. and his career. So I do not really subscribe to this conspiracy theory. Although some people are saying that it's a plan not to have him extradited. Mm -hmm. But if the allegations against him are true, he's also going to face trial and face the law. So I, I, I don't know, but in Nigeria, you know, they will sometimes tell you that anything is possible. But, but it's if, also possible the... the, the, the the, the the charges it will be the charges could also dif be different from drug peddling 
to a conspiracy, and that um, that lets him off the hook. Is it also is it is it must be also an offence against the NDLA Act and other conspiracy? It's, it's an offence in a matter related to drug. No, maybe it's not the one peddling. It may be conspiracy. Yes, yes. it's uh, the subject matter is yes. conspiracy yes. in aiding and abetting drug peddling. Yes, so. It's a, related, it's a related matter which will carry his own offense, his own <laughs> uh, punishment. It's very damaging to his person and his, uh, and his, um, and his career. And I, and I think that uh, I must salute the courage of the NDLA. Uh, of course, as we are going beginning to see, uh, a lot of heads are going to roll, both in the police and in the NDLA. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, certainly I cannot escapate both sides at yeah. the end of the day. But for Buba Mawa to have come out and uh, show as an example this type of thing. I mean, it shows a lot of courage yeah. on the part of his leadership. And I think that uh, we must salute uh, the NDA leader he's leading now. And I can assure you that there are many more of this type of cases that you come up with. <laughs> yeah. Because we have becoming, we have continued to live in a nation of lawlessness. Mm -hmm. And if that be the case, then it won't take us anywhere. And if we must develop, and have an economy, have a nation mm. where opportunities are, are evenly spread and yeah. people have opportunities economically and socially. We must reduce incidences of crime, incidences of favoritism, mm. incidences of uh, countermanding or uh, aiding and abetting uh, criminality so that everybody will begin to live in accordance with the law. Yeah. Thank you. If you are still watching us, um, uh, feel free to call us. The lines are displayed on the screen. Uh, call us and share your thoughts with us. Honorable, and there's this issue that we will go into, but before then, let's, let's, let, me find, let me find out from you. The, the fuel issue in the, the contaminated fuel um, that was imported into the country. And don't you also think, and nobody has resigned, nobody has been sacked. I mean, how, how do you see that? And today we are suffering, they're still everywhere, the, the nation is almost uh, grinding. What do you think? It's part, it's part of the failure. Yes. It's part of the failure of governance and leadership. Not just at national level, yes. at institutional level. Yes, at yes, yes. You see, when we begin to blame one man who is the president at the top, you know, we miss the point. Mm -hmm. Yes, the box stop on the table as the head mm -hmm. to take decisive actions yes. when matters arise. Yes. But they are failures at different levels. And is this, that act alone is an economic sabotage. It is, it is, it is. And to be honest with you, the head should roll. Yes, somebody People should resign. People should resign. People should be sacked if they don't want to resign. Yes, yes. I mean, we cannot begin to trade blames. We can't begin to trade blames. After all, this sector is being regulated. I mean, it's being controlled. People are taking decisions on behalf of the nation on how this matter should go. So, for me, it is part of what we are saying that when a situation where rule of law, obedience to rules, obedience to, 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 to fundamental principles of governance are breached, are not followed, then and people are not made to take responsibility, yes. then we begin to wallow in a vicious circle you know, of failure, uh, failure of governance. Yeah. And that is my, that was my own take. I, I believe that the, 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 you are passing the suffering to the citizens. Yes. And those who are responsible, either by act of negligence, either by act of omission mm. of negligence, mm. should take responsibility. It's not the citizens. No. Because government and governance exists for the sake for of the, the citizens. Yes. So why would you subject the citizens to the harrowing experiences that they are going through now for the failure of some person. No, to add to it that you'll be needed over two billion, two hundred billion. Now to not clear up the mess. Clear, I mean, how is, you... <laughs> is, 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 that, that is sabotage. Yes. I mean, that is corruption at the end of the day. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make, and this is a nation where we are now servicing loan mm -hmm. with trillions of naira. Yes. We just announced that 18 months will be the period of moratorium to continue to hold on to the hydra headed subsidy regime. Hmm. 18 months? 18 months is the period of moratorium yes, within yes. which to continue to subsidize. Yes, yes. <laughs> now, yes. and to do that, yes. the Minister of Finance has said we will need about a trillion plus yes. to do that. And now, in the meantime, some people are sabotaging 
the process mm -hmm. by importing contaminated mm -hmm. fuel mm -hmm. at serious expense mm -hmm. to the masses. Yes. And we are going to be required over 200 billion. Yes. Now, how do you position that within the context of the 2022 budget? A budget that is already running in deficit. Yes. A budget for which we are paying so much <laughs> to... No, we are not criticizing government. This is the exact situation. It's not a matter of uh, what what one should say or what one should not say. It's, it's, a, it's a reality on ground. Government should look much more closely to those responsible for sabotaging yes, our economy. Yes. Remove the bad eggs so that the process can begin to experience some sanity. Mm -hmm. Until people are being used as examples mm -hmm. of not permission of wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. Our country and our citizens and our leaders are not going to learn. Yeah. The masses should not be made to suffer for the in acts of indiscretion, yeah. for the criminal, res uh, criminal behavior of some public officers. It shouldn't be so. It, the society must be good for all of us. Thank you so very much. We appreciate that point um, that is clearly made. Un unfortunately, we are, in, we are in it together. All right. We are all suffering in it together. Mm -hmm. Honorable, if, um, if um, as a lawyer now, as a lawyer and as a teacher, you have a case in court um, for which the tenor of, of uh, you are pursuing an office which has a tenor of four years, and you then institute a case in court, and uh, for two years, seven months, um, the case is not being heard. It's, for instance, this Edo State House of Assembly, what, what, what do you think is the solution to that? Well, I, I think that uh, the Edo State House of Assembly case is a watershed in the history of democratic governance yes. in Nigeria. And it is worth looking at in a dissertation. <laughs> and the obvious conclusion that can always come out yes. in the abstract will always be that undemocratic elements mm. took over office and ran the state undemocratically. Yeah. Because truth must be told, regardless of uh, who is involved, a do state is not running a democratic government at the moment. No. The reason is clear. The government is being run in in, in, in a violent contradiction mm. to the Constitution yeah. of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, the government of the day there has continued to say, oh, some members refuse to present themselves for swearing in. But the truth of the matter is that what happened was such that even when they decided to go and do a nocturnal inauguration at night, mm. they did not invite them. <laughs> they were not invited. Even for the nocturnal Even inauguration. For the, nocturnal, <laughs> the, 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 the people were not invited. And uh, this, this, is the only, this is the only time in the history of that state. I was a member of that, that assembly. I contested the election thrice into that assembly, and I was sworn in once. On the first occasion, I was not sworn in because the transition across the country was not complete. It was incoherent. In 1987, I first won my election into the Edu State House Assembly in 1997. After six months, and uh, General Sani Abacha died, the transition was truncated. Yes. And so we have to start again. The entire process started again. In 99, we won and I went back. Inauguration of a State Assembly is a legislative ceremony. Yes. It's a major event that kickstarts the life of an assembly. Yes. So in 2019, mm. it didn't happen in a it's not a night party. It didn't happen. In, so that yeah. event did yeah. not happen. No. It happened in an aberrant manner, mm. wherein on the 19th of June, some people were conscripted and were inaugurated at night. Inauguration is done in the full glare of the whole world. They can't tell us where that happened. So in a dog state, we have an abnormal situation where we do not have the complete number of members of the House of Assembly in accordance with Section 91 of the Constitution. Because it says that no House of Assembly in Nigeria shall have less than 24 members or more than 40 members. Yes. Because it is to ensure that every segment of the state is represented. 
Now, what we have there today is like, it just is now like a local government council, mm. where that has 10 wards being represented by one councillor. Hmm, local government council. Yes. That, that is true. That is the situation now. <laughs> that is true. And they don't say it's not a local government no, under the constitution. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, he, those who, who masterminded this on trump up charges mm. and fear of the unknown, mm. uh, we have their date with history yeah. in terms of uh, having to pay for it, yes. one way or the other. Yes. And I fear if their actions, since this aberrant situation was instituted mm. in a do state i doubt if their action has the force of law including the expenditures that have been made and purportedly approved by an unconstitutional legislature yeah. and i hope and pray that someday the court will make a pronouncement on the legality yes. or otherwise of the current House of Assembly in Edo State, vis a vis the actions yes. of the government that have continued, you know, to run its course yes. on the basis of approvals received from this assembly. Time will tell. Yes. Now, again, back to the issue the, the non hearing of a case within. Within, I mean, uh, you know, the question you are asking is yeah. about the nature of the justice system and administration in our country, yes. where cases are fired and they take almost eternity to be heard. Yes. Yes. It's not as if they are not hearing it. I mean, they, they are unduly being delayed. You go to court, they are joined for one reason. Flims, the, are the flimsiest excuse, excuse cases are joined. So it is, that's a byproduct of hmm. our judicial system. Yes, yes. Our judicial system needs to, to, to recreate itself and stop this undue delays, even on matters in which time is supposed to be of essence. And, and I doubt if the heads of the courts where these cases are being instituted uh, do not seem to understand uh, the essence, why time is of essence in matters of this nature. Yes. I mean, there are cases where time is of essence, yes. and these cases are examples. Yes. So the such cases ought to have been allotted time within which they should be concluded by heads of court through practice directions. Because they are political cases, even though not contemplated by any extant law, as in the case of election petitions. Yes. But these are political cases, you know, whose outcome, one way or the other, depends on the tenure of an institution yeah. or the tenure of office of an individual. Yes. So I, I think this is one area the court needs to look at by way of judicial, uh, um, judicial reforms. Mm. Yeah. If you have, um, if you are in the seat of the governor or in the position of these members or in the position of leadership, uh, would you prefer an alternative conflict resolution in resolving this issue? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, you are saying if I am, if I am in the position, yes, I'm not in the position of the governor and I'm not in the position of... Uh, the members, yes. but I feel they are paid because that's my constituency. Yeah. In any case, I'm in a position of a political leader from the state. Yes. Now, yes. truth of the matter is that Democrats anywhere in the world, people who believe in the tenets of democracy, yes. must not only look at legal solutions yes. to yes. conflicts and resolutions. Yes. Because yes. conflicts and disagreements are necessary ingredients of a democratic yes. process. Yes. You must continue to disagree, yes. to agree. Yes. But what is important is that you must dialogue to agree. You must collaborate. You must consult. These are necessary tools for conflict resolution. Now, if the governor is a believer in democracy, is a believer in the rule of law, as the leader of the government of Edo State, it lies squarely on his laps to call for a truce. And I'm also aware that many well-meaning citizens, public officers across the nation, have initiated moves at the very early stage for a political solution to this whole thing. But the government of the state uh, was not going to listen. I mean, no man will have an election and they don't want to be sworn in. Yes. No person would do that. Will any governor have an election and then by some design, an impostor is sworn in or some other person is sworn in and then he 
He's happy about it. Happy. So they are not happy. The young men and the the the, the, the patriotic uh, citizens who were elected are not sworn in. They, 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 they are not happy about it. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is that you can't continue to deny their constituents because it's not about them. No. It's not about them. Yes. It's their constituents. Yes. I mean, I was in that house. I represented them every single day of the four years. My constituency. But our brothers who have the same opportunity in 2029, 14 of them have de denied that opportunity. Not by the same electorates, but by powerful forces who are frustrating the will of the people to have representative in the floor of the house. But like I said, a time will tell. But let me even digress a little. There is this um, thinking from the other end that these guys are planning to impeach the governor. Do, do you, is, uh, does that make any meaning or any sense? I mean, impeachment, impeachment is, uh, is a tool in the constitution for putting in check a chief executive who has violated the constitution. How can members who have just been elected into the house have not started to function in their capacity as legislators, the planning to impeach. In any case, the law does not say that you can impeach for any reason. The law does not say that the day you are inaugurated, that day you can begin an impeachment and conclude it. There are processes. That is, those are, that's a subterfuge. They are just surreptitious move to continue to deny these young men the opportunity of representing their people on the altar of financial convenience to them because they feel that it is a body left off their neck. They can rule the state without legislature. That is the meaning. They are not democratic. They are not democratic. That is the hallmark of dictatorship. That is what we are seeing. So the accusation that they were planning how do you how do you determine the plan? What were the evidences? Where is the impeachment notice? Where is the evidence that these guys were planning to impeach? Impeach you for what? In any case, when the governor was elected, he was elected and met a legislature in place. That legislature worked with him until the end of the life of that assembly. They didn't impeach him. And some of them were part of those that have returned by way of election. So what has happened that impeachment will not be the, their first assignment? I doubt that very well. It is a subterfuge mm. to just to derail the wills, the, the smooth grinding will of democracy. If you the find the government back to APC, what will be your reaction? You know, we live in an, uh, an, an, uh, <laughs> you need a political situation in, in Nigeria mm. with very irresponsible political behavior yes. uh, accepted as a new as a normal yes. as a norm new norm new i would be surprised yeah. i mean after all he went to pdp yes. it's almost the norm and uh, if he comes if he comes if he goes to apc he will be exercising his rights of freedom of association yeah. at least that is how it is defended <laughs> as a democrat uh -huh. okay. but that is not it is not consistent mm. with good democratic behavior mm. i mean it just shows how hollow uh democratic processes are uh, because there is no ideology that separates one party from the other uh, even 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 when progress progressive forces uh, comes on board before you know it the conservative forces take over and they run the system around and return us to to the old ways so it, it to be his right and uh, I, I don't know i have nothing to say about that why, why we're trying to round up this um, discussion um, you are a leader in uh, Edo South, Edo South Centura District. In Edo State, you are a leader. In Edo South, you are a leader. Then, you know, um, where you are from, uh, you are also a major stakeholder. Now, um, there is this um, consistency in the South, Orion uh, consistency, Orion South, then Orion East, and Uru that make up the the federal constituency. Now, people are saying that uh, the South had it, oh, they had it, so it's, it's, it's the turn of the East. Do you share in that? Um, I, I, will, uh, I will perhaps uh, ask you to excuse me from uh, those discussions. You know, in the political contest, people throw up all kinds of arguments yeah. to favor them. Yes. And uh, 
the only agreement that I was party to. Yes. And indeed, I was secretary to that elders committee that uh, agreed. Uh, gentleman agreement yes. was that for the purpose of election to the House of Reps, uh, between Orion and Hunde, which is one federal constituency, and two local governments, it shall be rotated between the two constituencies so that no one local government, either by strength of numbers... Is there are three constituencies. There, are two, there is one federal constituency, yes. then three state constituencies. Yes. That's what you mean. Yes. So for the purpose of the House of Representatives, yes. election into the House of Representatives for my federal constituency, the only one who there, yes. that constituency is one. Yes and with two local governments. Yes. So it is a federal constituency of two local governments. Yes. The calculation is not based on the number of state constituencies. Okay. So it's between Orion 1 and Hode, mm -hmm. so that when Orion 1 have two terms, Hode will have two terms in rotation. So and that is why in that federal constituency from 99 to date, yes. no person had, had the privilege of having a third term yeah. consecutively yes. because after two terms it must go back yes. that is the agreement that the political leaders many of some of who are now ancestors yes. had at that time so those who are clamoring for the rotation of that seat among the among the state constituencies yes. are doing so apparently if you look deeper because it perhaps is favoring their interest okay. but that is not the consideration for them absolutely not the consideration so where what when dr pius udubu went from the Urugbe Aziz, yeah, orion was out orion was out yeah. uh, of course i went from who there yes and then of course uh, the, present person. the present person is from orion or east, east yes. so if you even if you go by that calculation yes. the three state constituencies have had had, yes. so, so that it should not go back to south again it cannot it, it wasn't decided on that basis okay it has to go back to who there okay it must come back to who the local government that is the that is the rule okay okay, okay it yeah. must come back to, yeah. yes it's on the basis of two local governments now um some some guys finally some guys are saying now in the 2023 election it is better you give your, you present your first 11 to contest the election in the person of um, the suggested names and um, that uh, look for us to win this election let us get um to go to senate let us get um, um dr samson Osage to go back to the house of rep of course he's going to be a ranking member and a principal officer which will bring dividends of democracy more of it to the state and there are a lot of suggestions like that um i want to ask does that um will that make the apc your party win election in the state well uh for me i have not declared any election to contest yes. i have yes. not declared any interest to contest any election yes as we speak i have yes. not declared yes. but secondly too i believe that my experience in politics yes. spanning almost 25 years now out of which i have spent a substantial part of it 25 years in in uh, the legislature yes. don't forget i was a senatorial candidate in 2015 people forget so yes, easy. 2015. i was this party senatorial candidate yes. i won a primary that was hotly contested yes. at the yes. Stadium. Yes. so i do not uh, for now uh, harbor any definite ambition to contest as i speak with you in this studio but the truth is that politics is about the people yes if what the people want is what they are going to clamor for or they are going to clamor for who gives them money now they will get either depending on the one they want yeah yeah so it's left for them because the people get the leadership they deserve i mean i have not it's a familiar terrain the edo south central district in terms of election is familiar to me of course the only one who the uh, federal constituency where i've contested election uh, uh twice yes. because twice house of rep yes. has a uh, century election that makes them is also very familiar so i am not uh, i'm not declaring any interest to contest any election uh the people will have to decide what they want yes I, i'm not saying you are de declaring intention people are saying that let us present fair, our first 11 strong people, people are airing their opinion yes 
Uh -huh. if that, is that Will opinion? you advise the party to look into that? I'm not in the position to advise the party because... No, but you're also not going to tell the party to bring in people who know in the election. No, you know my challenge, eh? you know my challenge eh? in this political process. Yes. When leaders sit down to discuss what should be done, they can hardly divorce themselves from their ambition, from their own personal ambitions. <laughs> that is true. So whatever advice you give, if it's not going to align with their personal ambitions, they are not going to take it. So you, we need a fundamental, a fundamental uh, renaissance mm. in our thought process as political leaders to decide what is good. Now we are beginning to feel the impact of leaders of yesteryears who mm -hmm. have gone to join the we ancestors. Are, we are, we are. In the past, you are going to find people who, who will say, okay, how do we get this thing done? No, yes. it is no more so now. We are only going to find people who say, whether the election is going to be won or not, yes. they put their cronies. Yeah, exactly. And they lose the election. Or they sell it yes. to the highest bidder. So the outcome, they don't care. So I'm not going to be here and begin to advise anybody. But I believe that if the party is serious in winning, he should look closely at those who are capable of giving them victory. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the result will tell. Yeah. So for me, right now, I am glued to my legal practice yeah. as a professional. Yeah. And uh, together with other things I'm doing, uh, I do not know any definite ambition at the moment. And uh, those who are aspiring, it is within their rights to aspire. And uh, we can only wish a party and the people ultimately yes. who deserve good governance, yes. good representation, yes. the best in this process. Finally, finally, your party is yet to begin the sales of um, forms and um, zoning has not been concluded or announced um, at the national. Um, there are worries here and there. Would you want to share your thoughts? John, I will ask you to please excuse me. Oh. <laughs> because. Um, I'm not too clear about their direction, so I would not like to speak further on what they are doing. We are expecting the national convention, however they yeah, want to do yes, it. Yes, yes. Wow. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Honorable Dr. Samson Osage, for this uh, wonderful outing. I sincerely appreciate your time, and I appreciate all of you who join us um, in this show. Um, until we come your way again, um, thank you so very much, and uh, bye for now.